Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to give everybody a couple minutes to get in here. We've got a few of them in right now. Just going to give it a couple of seconds. All right. Uh, my name is Dave Hatton. I'm a financial consultant with First Midwest Financial Network here in Gurney, Illinois. And uh, our disclaimer uh, is on the screen. If you want to just take a quick look at that while well, I'm just doing an introduction here real quick. Uh, we're joined today by Jason Meyer, and Jason is the managing partner and uh, the director of advocacy for Eventide Investments. Eventide's tagline is investing that makes the world rejoice, and they put their full faith behind important process, behind their investment process and their products. And when I started in this business 20 plus years ago, um, socially responsible investing, as it was called at that time, was merely an afterthought. And over the years, the idea of aligning one's money with one's values became more and more accepted, and, and oftentimes it became expected. And the Eventide family really considers itself to be at the forefront at, of the, the ESG, or environmental, social, and governmental wave. And if just a real quick, I'm going before I uh, introduce Jason and let him take over. If you have any questions, please uh, just type them into the uh, the Q and A box at the bottom or in the chat box. We'll reach them at the end, um, and we'll have uh, an opportunity to to respond to any of those. So please again, make sure that you put any questions you have as you go along. And with without further ado, Jason Meyer. Thanks, Dave. Uh... It's good to do an event with you. We were just catching up before we went live and uh, our, our relationship goes back a few years. So this is a, a treat for me to, to get to uh, do a, a webinar together with you. I just wanna say a warm hello to all of you that are joining in for a topic that I, I hope you'll really enjoy. It's something that I'm very passionate about. It's the power that our investments have to change the world around us. Um, so he, this is me. I'm Jason. Good to meet you. I'm a managing partner of Eventide. We're a mutual fund company in Boston that specializes in values-based investing. My day-to-day -day work is in advocacy, where I'm an advocate for values-based investing. This is going to be an educational presentation, not a product pitch. Um, this is a way for you to think about investing in a little bit of a different way. So we're talking about the power to change the world. How does the world change. Uh, we need a good working theory about this. And so I'm gonna lay out a case for us here to consider. The first thing we need to do is just set aside the things that do not fundamentally, in a significant way, change the world. This is gonna be the most controversial thing that I say all day. Um, but the first way the world does not fundamentally change is through politics alone. Uh, a lot of people here in the US increasingly are putting their hope in politics. I remember the presidential election this last year, it seemed like the fate of the world hung in the balance. And there were many people that had a lot of anxiety about that. Um, but if you think about it, politicians, they have to have their finger up into the wind. They have to be reading which way the winds are blowing. They have to operate as a servant to the will of the people and the winds of society. They're hired to enact ideas that have been in circulation for a long time that have been embraced popularly and they can't really go against those forces. So they're often downstream of many culture changing ideas. Additionally, the world does not change through individuals alone. Here in America, we have the idea of heroes and rugged individualism. And we of course remember heroes, people like William Wilberforce. But if you're a student of history and you've read biographies, you realize it was never one person alone. There were many other forces at play. So this case, uh, these are not my own thoughts. These are the thoughts of this man. This is James Davison Hunter, who is a sociologist from the University of Virginia. I think he's one of the leading thinkers on culture change. So how does the world change? I wanna read you a quote from him, which will frame today's conversation. This capacity to change the world is not evenly distributed in a society. It is concentrated in certain institutions and among certain leadership groups who have a lopsided access to the means of cultural production. Very fancy way of saying that institutions hold power. So think about the institutions of Hollywood. Think about the institutions of higher education. Think about the institutions of news media. There are these particularly 
uh, high, highly concentrated sources of power um, that shape our world. And what I want to try to convince you of is that investing is also one of these institutions of power. In fact, I think it's one of the most powerful. I'm going to try to prove that to you by showing you this power in history. And then I want us to then think about how we can harness this power in modern investing through the decisions we make. Okay. So to kick it off, I want to talk about a well-known story. Uh, take a look at the picture of this man on the screen and see if you can remember who this is. If you go back to your middle school history days, this is Christopher Columbus, who set sail on one of the most famous voyages of all time. And we all know it, right? He sailed the ocean blue in 1492. But what many of us don't know about the story of Columbus is actually the investing story behind this journey. What Columbus was trying to do was to access a new trading route with Japan, China, and India by sailing west off of Europe. He had done some calculations and figured that Japan was 3,000 miles west off of Europe. He was obviously dead wrong about that, but that's what he believed. And he wanted to go and establish a new trading business to, to do uh, uh, trading with those places. Very risky, right? No one had ever done this. Very expensive as well. So you had the ship, his crew was about 70 strong. It would have been in the tens of millions of dollars in today's uh, dollars. And nobody had the money to finance this. So what he had to do was go all over Europe trying to find investors. Okay, so he started in Italy, where he was from, and was turned down by investors there. He went to France and heard nothing but no. He went to England, no. He finally heard a yes in Spain from Spanish investors. And maybe you remember the story of Ferdinand and Isabella. By the way, he struck a very sophisticated deal with these investors. He negotiated the right to get 10% revenue from this trading route personally pretty interesting, and an option to invest up to one eighth in any commercial business that would be established in lands that he would claim for Spain. So it's a little unusual to think of Columbus this way, but it really was a for-profit business that was backed by investors. This is what investing used to be like. Now we know what happened. He did not discover Japan. He ended up landing in the Caribbean and discovered new land there. Um, but what I want you to consider is the world change, okay? I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but why does Central America speak Spanish? Why is the major religion of that whole territory Roman Catholic? Why does their diet consist of things like tortillas and not, for example, things like croissants? The answers to these questions lie with who invested. Because Spanish investors backed Columbus, he sailed under the Spanish flag, carried with him Spanish interests into the new territory. This is what determined the language, Spanish after Spain, uh, the religion, Roman Catholic, Spain is Roman Catholic, and things like tortillas, culture that came from Spain. And it could have gone a different way, right? It could have been the case that England had backed him. And had that happened, Central America would speak English, it would be a Protestant area, and it would look like British society. The world, uh, could have gone a different way. It was actually investors who decided the shape of the world. All right, uh, I know this is a new way to think. I wanna share another example with you. This is a map of the trading routes of the British India Company in red and the Dutch East India Company in yellow. These were also shipping companies. Uh, economic historians will tell you that the world of modern investing was born out of this shipping industry in the 1400s, 1500s, and especially the 1600s. These two companies were established in 1600 and 1602. Now, these are the first two truly modern corporations, as you and I would think about them today. What made them modern? They raised the capital that they needed by issuing stocks and bonds to ordinary investors. The first time that had ever been done. And we also get the world's first stock exchange in Amsterdam where people could then trade these stocks and bonds with one another to gain liquidity back on their investments. Did these two companies change the world? <laughs> Good or bad? Yes, they did. In the case of the British India Company, India actually becomes a colony of Britain. 
Pretty amazing. This is why to this day, although not a lot of people know this, the official language of India is, can you guess? It's English. Um, how did that happen? <laughs> they have the second largest English speaking population in the world. And if you count those that speak English as a second language, they're number one in the world for speaking English. How did that happen? It happened through the British India Company. And if you know anything about Indian history from the railroad to the university to its political structures, all of that came, uh, it's the legacy really of this one company and investors. What about the Dutch East India Company? Well, they got started in 1602. By the year 1634, they had grown in value to in today's dollars being valued at $8.2 trillion with a T you might be wondering how that compares with big companies today. It dwarfs them. Uh, this is the answer to the trivia question, what's the most valuable company that's ever existed? It's the Dutch East India Company. And as a result of that size and scale, they had massive impacts all over Southeast Asia. Here again, investors changed the world. Now, were these investors world changers? Probably not. They were probably just like you and me, looking to grow their money. Nevertheless, investing has this power. It's very powerful. And I want us to key in on that. So the world of investing is off and running in the 1600s. It should be no surprise that abuse soon followed. And one of the people that would speak about this is someone you probably recognize, Daniel Defoe, who wrote Robinson Crusoe. Here's what he had to say about investing in his day. This is in the year 1697. Investing has raised the fancies of credulous people to such a height that merely on the shadow of expectation, they formed companies, chose committees, appointed officers, shares, books, raised great stocks, and cried up an empty notion to that degree that people have been betrayed to part with their money for shares in a new nothing. And when the inventors have carried on the jest till they've sold all their own interest, they leave the cloud to vanish of itself and the poor purchasers to quarrel with one another, to go to law about settlements, transferrings, some bone or other thrown among them by the subtlety of the author to lay blame of the miscarriage upon themselves. Thus the shares at first begin to fall by degrees and happy is he who sells in time to like brass money, it will go at last for nothing at all. I'm really glad we don't talk like this anymore. This is very dense, complicated language. It's actually only two sentences, but hopefully you followed. He's saying that everybody is really excited about investing in this day. You got these new stocks and bonds that are coming out on the market. People are hoping to get rich, and so they're snapping them up. Some unscrupulous business people are watching from the sidelines, so they decide to enter the fray and launch basically fake businesses to relieve people of their money and then make it look like an ordinary business failure where they abscond with the profits and leave everybody else uh, holding the bag and fighting over table scraps. So there was a lot of greed. There was a lot of unethical business practices. Somebody needed to come along and speak a word of truth and ethics into the world of investing. And the person that would do that is a man named John Wesley. John Wesley was a Christian minister in England in the 1700s. Uh, if you recognize him, it might be because uh, he founded what's called the Methodist movement within Christianity. And this is his most famous quote. He says, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Isn't that beautiful? This is one of my favorite quotes. So John Wesley was watching the mess of investing in his day, and he decided to speak into it. And, and what he did is he preached a very practical sermon to his congregation. You can see the year here is 1759. I want to share a passage from his sermon uh, this sermon has become very important in the history of investing because it's credited as starting what today we would refer to as responsible investing, sustainable investing, impact investing, values-based investing, lots of terms. Here's, here's a quote. I'm not going to read it all. I want to highlight a couple things to you, though. He says, we are thirdly to gain all we can without hurting our neighbor. So he was not opposed to making money. He says, gain all we can. But make sure that those gains are not coming from harm of neighbor. He says this, we cannot do if we love our neighbor as ourselves. We cannot, if we love everyone as ourselves, hurt anyone in his substance. 
He then goes on to apply this to some of the businesses and investments in his day. I'm going to skip ahead to the end of this quote here and highlight a principle that he lays down. And I'm going to expound on him. We're looking at the last two sentences here. He says this, if the profits we receive from businesses or investing come from activities that profit or benefit the souls of men, you're clear. Your employment's good, your gain is innocent. But if those profits come from activities that are either sinful in themselves, remember he was a Christian minister, or natural inlets to sin of various kinds, then it is to be feared you have a sad account to make. Oh, beware, lest God say in that day, these have perished in their iniquity, but their blood do I require at thy hands. Wow, right? Strong language. He is here raising the stakes on investing considerably. Investing, he says, is, is not just a way to gain our money or lose our money. He says there are greater risks than these if we profit from activities that harm our neighbor. So what he did is he connected the profits of investing with the behind the scenes activity, reminding his congregation of the importance of having investments match with one's commitments in life. If we skip ahead to the present day and just think about some big companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Netflix, hopefully you'll agree with me, these companies have changed our world, how we get information, how we form our opinions, um, how we get our news, how we spend our leisure time. And guess what? All of these companies exist only because of investors. First, investors who were venture capital investors, then initial public offerings pushed higher by secondary markets. I'm not trying to make a value judgment for or against these companies, but simply to point out the role that investors play in shaping the world. I want to give you one final example from history. This is my favorite. I think this is just an incredible example of how investing can change the world for the better. So if we roll back to the year 1971, there were a lot of Christians as well as many others here in the US that were very concerned about apartheid. Now, in case you're fuzzy, um, I'm gonna give you a refresher on apartheid. So apartheid is a word that comes from a language in South Africa from the Afrikaans, and it means separation. That word apartheid can literally be translated as aparthood or to keep separate. And it described an institutionalized racial segregation that existed in South Africa in that day, where the local black population was kept separate from the white population and treated in an inferior manner. So a lot of people in the US were watching this from afar, were very concerned. I mentioned how politics can sometimes be powerless. And here's an example. The South African government had already ignored multiple United Nations sanctions and embargoes. So all these other nations are trying to put pressure on South Africa to get them to end this racial segregation. And, there's, and South Africa is saying, who cares? Find us all you want. What do you do? How do you change this? Well, a group of Episcopals decided to take up the power of investing to change the world. So the Episcopal church was looking at their investments and they realized that they were investing in General Motors, the automotive company, and General Motors had operations in South Africa. They put two and two together. They said, wait a minute. Um, we don't like what's happening in South Africa. We're investors in this company. Let us express our displeasure and ask General Motors to change their practices with respect to segregation within their business in South Africa. So that's what they did. Um, this is the first example of what today we call shareholder advocacy. And to write this letter, they enlisted the help of this man. This is Leon Sullivan. You can see he was a black man. He was a Baptist minister and an anti-apartheid activist. So he grew up in Philadelphia and uh, was very concerned about apartheid. And he worked with these Episcopals and they came up with what they called the Sullivan Principles after Leon Sullivan, a set of specific proposals for General Motors to satisfy the investor concerns. It was things like, GM, you've got to have equal pay for equal work. You have to have the same working conditions for blacks and whites. You have to integrate your bathrooms and your water fountains. Those were segregated, it was things like that. They proposed this in this letter to GM. General Motors decides to do it. 
And then incredibly, they bring Leon Sullivan onto the board of General Motors to help give them guidance. Then guess what happens? Ford and Goodyear, two other automotive companies with operations in South Africa, they're looking at GM and they're saying, hey, we should do that too. So they adopt the Sullivan principles and one by one by one, like dominoes, companies adopt these principles and then the wider culture begins to change. In fact, history remembers that one of the key instruments in the fall of apartheid was this investor pressure. By the way, these Episcopals had 0.006% of the outstanding shares in GM. They were not big institutional investors that were forcing their way. They were ordinary people who simply invested with intention and bless the lives of millions. Pretty cool, I think. So how do we do this? I wanna to jump to the present day. If this power is real, how do we harness it? Well, a few comments. We have to be intentional. We have to do something different, right? If we just invest in the status quo, we will reap the status quo. So if you wanna see the world look different in various ways, you have to do something different. We gotta to work together. No one of us with our IRA or our 401k it's going to make much of a dent in a world of trillions of dollars. But if we work together collaboratively, forming networks and working across distances, we gain a lot more force. And then finally, we need tools, ways to put this intentionality and collaboration into practice. That's what my company does. Financial advisors are a part of this too, uh, through conversations with clients. Now, what do we mean by intentionality? It sounds good, but a little vague. Well, there's three ways you can be intentional. The first is what's called avoid. You can choose to avoid investing in companies that have problems. This is what John Wesley was talking about in his sermon, choosing to forego the profits that come from activities that harm our neighbor. And this is a pretty well established practice uh, in the world today. You can actually screen out and avoid problem areas. Number two, you can choose to embrace companies for the good things they're doing in the world. I'm going to talk more about that. And finally, you can engage companies. If you're a shareholder, you are an owner, you have a voice, and you can do what the Episcopals did with General Motors in apartheid and express that voice. I want to give you now three examples of this embrace dimension. Good things that I think are happening in the world today that I think we can be really excited about getting behind with our investment dollars. The first of these is in the area of clean energy. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a different take on this one. I want to read you some headlines from India recently. India's pollution today is as deadly as the black smog that covered Britain during the Industrial Revolution. New Delhi's gas chamber smog is so bad that United Airlines has stopped flying there. Look at this last one. Breathing in Delhi air is equivalent to smoking 44 cigarettes per day. I don't know if you have been to India, to some of the big cities, but if you have, you know exactly what this is describing. I'm going to show it to you. This is smog, not fog. <clears throat> this is in New Delhi. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is in New Delhi as well. This is a famous arch called the India Gate. Here's Beijing. Same image left and right. You can look at this red sign. On the left, a heavy rain's just come through, temporarily washing away the smog. Uh, on the right is what it looks like on a typical day. Here's the forbidden city in Beijing. You can see this brown cloud. This is also in Beijing. This is not at night. Here in the foreground, people are wearing face masks. Boy, isn't that familiar. But here there's no virus. This photo was taken long before that. It is a practice to wear a mask when you go outside. You start when you're a kid. You have every expectation of wearing a mask when you go outside for the rest of your life. These people are not trying to um, protect themselves from a virus. They're trying to breathe cleaner air. Here's one more picture from Beijing. This kind of pollution, which I just saw, you just saw, <clears throat> ordinary pollution accounts for 16% of all premature deaths worldwide. That's about 9 million lives lost per year. The leading cause, it exceeds tobacco smoking, road fatalities, drug overdoses, every kind of violence that exists in the world, including all war, this is the same data, but showing you the type of pollution. Blue is air, and it's very helpfully broken out by the wealth of countries. So you can see lower income countries, lower middle, upper middle, high income countries. Where are we? Right here. We walk outside, we take a deep breath, and we say, ah, it's a beautiful day. And indeed it is. 
I think one of the mistakes we can make is assuming that everywhere in the world has the same air quality. Uh, it's, not that, it's not that case. You can see that there's a big spike here in the lower middle income countries, places like India and China. And the reason for that is they're industrializing right now. And so there's a lot of pollutants in the immediate air, causes a lot of health consequences, and this is actually mortality. There's a great solution for this though, and it's to <clears throat> embrace clean energy, to harness the power of the sun, to power civilization without the pollutants. And I wanna read you a quote here. <clears throat> Sorry, let me get a glass of water. I'd put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. I wish I had more years left. Who said it? When I ask this in live audiences, um, they'll say, oh, is that Elon Musk or is that Al Gore, the former vice president? Almost nobody uh, thinks far enough back. This was actually Thomas Edison back in 1931. What we're doing with clean energy today has been a dream of inventors for a very long time. And I think it's an exciting innovation. And coronavirus gave us a glimpse of what impacting the world could look like. This is that India gate I showed you on the left, a photo taken November, 2019. On the right, one in March, 2020, during the coronavirus economic slowdown, the air cleared up. There was no rain, it just disappeared. And uh, beautiful blue skies, which of these would you rather live in, right? This is uh, kind of what we're attempting to, to do for parts of the world that are really suffering from this kind of pollution is to, to, to enable a more beautiful, clean and healthy world to live in. Let me give you another example, water technology. More than 2000 children die every day from water related illness. We're gonna talk about the problem of water in the world today. And so we need a working definition what does it mean when we say that someone has access to water? Maybe you've heard that before. What that means is that there's a source of water within a kilometer radius where you're able to obtain at least 20 liters of clean water for everyone in your house. Now, how much is 20 liters? Well, if you took a shower today and you're a typical American, you used 65 liters in that one shower. Here we're talking about 20 not just for showering, but down here, you can see all domestic purposes, drinking, cooking, as well as personal hygiene. So this is a lot less water than you and I would use, but this is what it means to have access to water. Now, how big of a problem is water today? Well, about a million people die each year from diarrhea due to water-related illness. 80% are children under the age of five. Dirty water is actually the second largest killer of children in the world. By 2025, how many people will not have access? 800 million, huge number. 133 million people have high intensity worm infections in their gut. Half the schools of the world don't have water. An investment in clean water has a big return for society. Now, why is that? Because people aren't sick. They're not on the toilet. They're not in the hospital. The healthcare system is less burdened. They're being a productive member in society and contributing economically. So the world experiences a great benefit for having this basic need met. This is my colleague, Finney. He's our chief investment officer here with three of his boys. He has eight kids. Uh, these photos are taken in Uganda. He goes there each year for church reasons, but while he's there, he tries to meet a need. Uh, before becoming an investor, he was a medical doctor in Boston hospitals. And so he conducts what's called a deworming clinic. That's why all these people are lined up. Basically everybody in Uganda has this critter living in their gut. This is Belharzia. It's a worm. You get it from drinking contaminated water. Um, it's very treatable, fortunately, but it's, it's such a temporary fix because you, know, you deworm somebody and, and then they drink contaminated water and then they get it again. So we have to address the root cause here. Most of the world, water is considered women's work. And the reason this is important is that young girls are often not able to attend school because they're so preoccupied with the task of fetching water for the family. It's a daily pressing need. Parts of the world are reaching crisis levels. Look at this well in Gujarat, India. A lot of people, not a lot of water, means that fights break out. Here's a quote. <clears throat> we face acute shortages of water, but water is available only two to three hours a day. Frequent fights. You need to walk 20 to 30 minutes to fetch water. It's so humiliating. We are not so advanced as a, as a 
global population as we imagine. So how do we fix it? Well, the world's got a lot of water. It's just an access problem. So most of the water in the world is locked up in the ocean where it's salt water or in glaciers and ice caps where it's frozen or underground where it's, it's uh, inaccessible. And if we actually look at the amount of surface water and get down to things like rivers and lakes, it's actually vanishingly small what's available for human consumption on that surface level. But what this chart also reveals is that if we could use technology and infrastructure backed by investment to access water, for example, that's locked up underground, it would be a tremendous benefit for the world. So what we decided to do was to invest in what we think is the, the global leader in water technology in the developing world. They're a leader here in North America and in Europe, but they're the leader also in the developing world. And this is by design. This is from their website, a publicly traded company. They have a 2025 goal to provide clean water to at least 20 million people living at the very bottom of the global economic pyramid, the poorest of the poor. Very unusual to see. This is backed by substantial volunteering and donation. You can see more than 110,000 employee service hours on clean water projects and more than 25 million given away to clean water since 2010. And this is just on top of their core business, which is focused on the problem. So I think really admirable company here. Let me give you uh, one final example, an unmet need in healthcare in the area of the central nervous system. So what do you know about the disease schizophrenia? I'm sure we've all heard of it, but what is it? It's kind of difficult to define because it's known by a collection of symptoms, which are depicted by this artwork here. There are what are called positive symptoms and negative symptoms. And as I read these, I want you to be thinking, where have I encountered schizophrenia in my life? People will suffer from delusions and hallucinations. They'll see things, they'll hear things. You'll hear uh, people say that the wall is talking to them. What they describe is often dark in nature. They'll have disorganized speech. On the negative side, they have what's called a flat affect, which means they lack the wide emotional range that you and I have. They'll have reduced speech and lack initiative, just can't get motivated. Anyone come to mind? If your mind went to the homeless, you would be correct. Schizophrenia is a vast problem among the homeless. It's one of the main drivers for homelessness in the world. As you look at these symptoms, you can see why that would be the case. It affects a lot more people than you may imagine, 3 million Americans. The treatments we have are ancient, they barely work, they have horrible side effects. The last FDA approved treatment for schizophrenia was the year 1952. 52, just ancient. The World Health Organization ranks it as the third most debilitating disease in the world. Another big problem here. Investing is often one of these ways where you can get involved at the root cause level. And so we have been very interested in, in this. We do a lot of healthcare investing. Not much has happened, but a company we invested in in the past came to us with a new idea for treating schizophrenia. So we were all ears. We invited them to the office. Uh, for them to make their case. They talked about the medical literature, the mechanism of action that they were developing in a new therapy. We took all that information in, analyzed it, put it through our gauntlet of tests, liked it, and decided to invest. And I'm not going to go over the how it exactly works, but I am going to describe their clinical trial. So what they did is they took a group of patients who had schizophrenia, split them up in half, 50-50. Half of them received a placebo, which is nothing, the other half received this new treatment that they had developed. They admitted everyone to the hospital for five weeks, and then they monitored those symptoms that I showed you. I'm gonna show you the results. So on the X axis, we see just the stay in the hospital. Baseline is day zero up to five weeks. On the vertical axis, it looks scary, but it's actually really simple. If you see this PANSS, what that stands for is positive and negative symptoms score showed you the positive and negative symptoms. So all they're doing is they're counting up how many symptoms someone is expressing, how severe it is, and calculating a number. And then they're just measuring that over the five weeks. You obviously want to see it get better, which is why it starts at zero and goes negative. So you want to see the line go down and to the right. So the black dotted line shows you the placebo group. You might be wondering, why did they get five points better? They're not getting anything. 
True, but this was expected actually. It's such a debilitating disease that just being in the hospital with regular care, you get a little bit better. But look at what happened with their new uh, therapy. They saw more than 15 point reduction in this PAN score, which clinicians told us was a complete game changer. It would change someone's life who suffered from schizophrenia. So this was huge, huge. And um, I mentioned the side effects were really bad on the old medicine, and that's important to address as well. So I wanna show you how that turned out. Um, you can get a sense for how bad side effects are in a clinical trial by just looking at how many people are electing to leave the trial before it ends. And you wanna know how many people are leaving who are getting the drug, how many people are leaving that are on the placebo. And if you see a lot more people leaving that are on the drug, tells you something, right? The side effects must be bad and they can't tolerate it, so they leave. Well, that number is 20% of the patients discontinued the trial that were on the drug, but 21% on the placebo, so no difference there. So we think this is really exciting. There's one more phase of the clinical trial they have to go through before the FDA could approve it. Um, we're optimistic based on this early data and we're investors, we're hoping for a good result. But how about the story, right? These stories we describe as investing that makes the world rejoice. There's a way for you to save your money, to grow it by investing in companies that are creating blessing and rejoicing in the lives of others. I wanna leave you with this quote. This is from the sociologist I opened up with who says this, most of us are inclined to what's been called the great man or the great person view of history. That the history of the world is but the biography of great men. The only problem with this perspective is that it's mostly wrong. Against this great man view of history and culture, I would argue along with many others, that the key actor in history is not the individual genius, but rather the network. One of the reasons why I love sharing this presentation is I wanna see a network, uh, a coalition of investors built up who want to use their money strategically in life to provide for their needs of their family, of course, but also to be a blessing in the world around us. And if this is, if this is you, um, you're a part of this through, through David and his firm, but uh, talk to him about ways that you can become even more engaged and involved. And with that, I'll, I'll welcome the team back on and we'd be happy to take any questions. You are muted, by the way, Dave. Thank you, Jason. That was uh, that was great. The um, and I just so everyone knows, full disclosure here, I am a shareholder with uh, Eventide, and I've got it. And as are a number of the uh, the folks on the on the call today, I want to go over a couple. I have a few questions here while we wait for stuff to come in. Uh, first one, more of a tongue in cheek. Um, would you consider the John Wesley quote, uh, the first one that you did? Yeah, uh, one of the longest run on sentences that you've ever done. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the older you go, the longer the sentences become. <laughs> yes. Um, what you mentioned the the values that started this really started off with our apartheid with General Motors. What sort of values um, are you seeing leading uh, the shareholder advo advocacy today? Yeah, shareholder advocacy. It's a very, I would say, heterogeneous movement, right? Because each company, there might be a specific thing that investors are trying to accomplish at that company. Um, so it's hard to kind of summarize all of it together. I would say there's a lot of energy today around equality in the workplace and hiring practices and diversity and inclusion. That's, that's certainly a big, <clears throat> a big topic on, on the hearts and minds of a, a lot of people today. Um, our particular engagements uh, so if you think about that avoid, embrace, engage framework, so kind of step one for us is to avoid some problem areas. Step two is to embrace companies we really like, and then we engage. So we're engaging with companies we already fundamentally like. So our engagements tend to be more uh, embellishments and improvements on an already admirable business. So just to give you one example, we uh, engaged a company, a retail company that had a, a branded credit card that had a very, very high interest rate. And so we worked with them to find a new credit card vendor whose interest rate would, would be 
um, much more um, ethical and fair to, to customers, things like that. Um, but yeah, out in the wider world, it can be very diverse and, um, you know, lots of different things going on. You mentioned as you're going through that, that um, the drug with schizophrenia, uh, I don't know if this is the case or not, but I want to just mention something about this. And again, I've been in the business for 20 years. I've seen a number of different mutual funds and mutual fund families. And one thing that I found unique with, with you folks, and I, I'm pretty sure you still do it today. Um, you have a small sleeve that you can use for private equity. Yep. Correct. Can you talk on that just a little bit? And, and, yeah. um, and if that firm was a private equity acquisition, yeah. how, how does that benefit the, the shareholders of Eventide Gilead or Health and Science? or Yeah, or any of those funds? no, that's a great question. So uh, every mutual fund has the opportunity with a small percentage of its assets to invest in some private companies. You can actually do that with up to 15% of, of the monies that you manage on behalf of others. Now, a lot of mutual funds are just 100% investing in publicly traded companies because it's easier. There's a lot less you know, due diligence. There's a lot less rules and, and um, liquidity issues there. But you, there is that allowance. And even Tide takes advantage of that allowance. We, we try to take advantage of that 15% rule. Now you can't cross that 15% in, in any way, shape or form. So we actually stay a good bit lower than that. We invest in about 30 private companies per year um, at about 150 million currently uh, in total uh, dollars allocated. Uh, the schizophrenia example was a private company. It was not publicly traded when we first invested in it. And the cool thing about that is if you buy a company on the stock exchange, you're buying a share of, of that company that's, that's been in circulation for a while. So your money doesn't go to the company. It just goes to the prior owner of those shares. But when you invest in the private market, your money goes directly into the balance sheet to help fund that business directly. And so uh, our shareholders um, actually funded that phase two clinical trial that I showed you. They actually made that possible and, and those results possible, which is pretty cool, right? Um, investing, there's a powerful linkage between um, you know, the money you invest and what it is accomplishing in the world. I think just for just investing in general, but especially when you can do this sort of private investing. So we really like to do that. And again, it's a very small percentage of what we do. Um, but we think that it's, it, you know, it's an additional value add and it allows us uh, to gain exposure to that impact side even more. Um, have a quick question here. Um, and more, I guess, more of a comment. Doing anything with depression after lockdown, the area of depression seems like a, like a possibility. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah. yeah, just speaking to the, and I'm sure you're, you see a lot of this coming up with um, and and given, I wanted to just make mention. You 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 mentioned it briefly, and Mike. I'm going to just address this as we go along here with this. Uh, Mike being the individual that put that in. Um, Finney's expertise. Can you just speak to that just really briefly? Because I think it, it kind of yeah. goes in hand in, in glove with, with what we're talking about here with with the uh, schizophrenia and some of the other some of your other key holdings in the fund. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so by the way, we are, um, we are very interested in depression and have some investments in that area. Um, it, is a, it is a fascinating space that is rapidly evolving. Um, and there are new classes of medicines that, that represent similar kinds of breakthroughs, we think, to the schizophrenia example that's there. Um, so I won't get into too many of the details there, but I will, I will answer your question, Dave. So yeah, Finney, who's our chief investment officer, his background is um, as a medical doctor and a venture capital healthcare investor. So he got um, his undergrad at Caltech in chemistry, um, master's degree from MIT in computer science and electrical engineering, PhD and medical doctorate from Harvard Med School. And then he went on to become uh, a, a medical doctor in some of Boston's best hospitals treating um, blood related disorders. So things like sickle cell anemia and leukemia 
And uh, then he really became fascinated with the world of investing because he was treating individual patients. But what he, he thought would be even more exciting than that was to actually get involved on the business side and the investing side, to actually bring to market these new therapies to treat these diseases at scale. And um, so he got involved on the venture capital side uh, around, the, around the same time that we launched Eventide and has come on full-time at Eventide now for many years. But that's, that's his background. And just a little note on, on Finney. One of his favorite quotes is from Henry David Thoreau. And it goes like this. For every thousand that are hacking at the leaves of evil, there is one striking at the root. And so that, that motivated him when he got into uh, healthcare investing is he felt like it was a way to strike at the root cause of many of these problems, rather than as a doctor where you often have to just treat the symptoms of these diseases. And so um, anyway, that's a, a little bit about our team and we've got a bunch of other healthcare folks as well. Yeah, good. Um, Back more towards uh, the, the what we're looking at, um, the topic at hand today, how does this differ? How does the the advocacy um, and investing portion of it, how does that differ from the, the, I guess the best way to put it would be the cancel culture today? Yeah, yeah, no, this is, this is, this is quite unique. You know, one of the things that makes us unique at, at Eventide is we actually are, I would say, philosophically pro-business, okay? There's, there's a, I think there's a pretty wide, wide opinion in society today that business is kind of a bad thing. And, you know, business is responsible for so much devastation and wealth inequality and, and on and on, right? So this, this would be like, um, the Occupy Wall Street movement was kind of laying many of the ills of society at the, at the foot of business. And to be sure, there is a lot of problem with problems within the world of business today. But we actually believe that business has a positive role to play in society by creating the products and services that meet human needs, that enable the human community to flourish. Business is uniquely doing that. And business is also the only institution of man that, that is wealth creating. And so there's the possibility for business to not only meet uh, material needs, but also to enlarge human wealth, right? So we are decidedly pro-business. And so we, we approach business um, not, not from the perspective that it's bad and we need to kind of beat it back, but rather um, we're trying to find what's good about it today and how can we strengthen that? How can we infuse capital into businesses that are serving as exemplars for what it should be? And, and then, you know, also using capital in ways to avoid companies that we feel like are some of those bad actors. But I would say that that, that positive purpose for business really motivates us. And it sets us apart a bit from what I think can be a pretty depressing and dark uh, world of kind of activist investing today that that really focuses on uh, kind of disparaging businesses and kind of uh, you know throwing them out into the darkness. So that it's a, just a different kind of approach and mindset. Thanks, Jason. I'm gonna. I don't. There are no more questions in here, but I'm gonna kind of follow up with one thing that you mentioned earlier on. Yeah. And if you want to to jump on in the end of this, that's fine. And we'll close out with that. Um, you mentioned uh, in your presentation that the uh, the that politicians are servants. And, um, and by definition, they are supposed to be there to be public servants. And we go back to the polls every two to four years to elect them and, uh, and, and allow them to be in service. The one thing I would say, given the fact that we're in a capitalist society, is that we, are, we vote for our politicians as servants every two to four years. We vote for the companies that we that serve us or, or provide services to us every day with our dollars. And there is not, we vote daily. This is, there's nothing more democratic than capitalism when, when you look at it in that way. So we have the ability to, to change it with a few shares of Abbott or AbV or whatever, which are both uh, right here in our backyards, just so you know, Jason. Um, we have the ability to, to change that 
every day with how we with where we vote with our pocketbook. And if you want to mention anything along those lines, that's great, and we'll we'll, we'll leave it with that. No, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I think many of us have really forgotten about this. I think for, for a lot of people, they view the purpose of investing as making a profit. And that's a part of investing, but businesses do not issue stocks and bonds so that we can save for retirement. <laughs> you, the reason they issue those stocks and bonds is so that they can get the capital they need to grow further, right? And so if, if you think about investing, not just as like a profit stream, but as a, a strategic decision about which businesses you want to advance. Every decision you make is an impact decision. It's just a matter of whether or not we're being attentive to those decisions. And I love the analogy to voting. I wholeheartedly agree. All right, well, we'll leave it at that. I, no further questions in here. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, and uh, we look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks, have a great day. Thanks, Jason.